Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for taking the time out of your uh, Wednesday morning uh, to spend the next uh, 50 minutes or so with me um, as we go over the 2018-2019 Pennsylvania State Budget and related issues. Uh, I'm Peter Calcara, Vice President of Government Relations for the PICPA. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna start right off um, with uh, the, the the webinar this morning. Uh, the good news is uh, that we have a state budget, um, and an early state budget at that. Um, this is uh, the earliest state budget in a number of years. I think you have to go back to uh, the Ridge administration uh, in the 1990s uh, to uh, come up with a comparable time frame in which uh, uh, a, a state budget was was enacted. So that's that's clearly a positive uh, development. Um, this budget process uh, didn't resemble anything that we've seen in the last three. If you go back to Governor Tom Wolf's uh, first budget in 2015, 2016, uh, where he was, uh, it was a nine month impasse where he was delivering his 16, 17 budget in February of that year with still an unresolved budget for the, uh, the, the current fiscal year that we were in. So I think this budget crept up on a lot of people. Um, because it was so um, quiet compared to what we've seen in, in uh, other past few years. And there wasn't that uh, moment where we have an agreement, uh, where legislative leaders stand together and say, we have an agreement, and you know, uh, six, 12 hours later, a day later, it blows up. Uh, none of that. It was a very uh, quiet process, uh, very much behind the scenes where uh, legislative leaders and their staff ironed out a budget, um, and it passed on June 22nd. So, well before uh, well before the June 30th, July 1st deadline, the first budget that Governor Wolf has signed into law, uh, obviously a positive. Um, and I think two two driving factors uh, created this er this early budget. One. Um, is the economy. Uh, the economy is is chugging along fairly well. Um, I think uh, if you look at uh, the independent fiscal fiscal offices June uh, June uh, middle of June report, they talk about um, an accelerated growth uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, they uh, target uh, GDP growth at, 2.3% in 2018 and 2.2% 2 .2 in 2019, which is slightly ahead of the last few years. And also uh, they cite uh, wage and salary growth uh, over the 18-19 period, uh, increased 4.3% in 20, uh, 2018 and 4.2% in 2019, which are, which are substantially higher than the uh, uh, previous years. Also, the Commonwealth added 62 plus thousand jobs uh, in 2000 or uh, in 2017 with the same number, of, uh, projected the same number in 2018. So the economy made things uh, a little bit easier for legislators. Tax revenues were coming in at, at projection. Um, and IFO also projects revenues, tax, base tax revenues to increase by 4% uh, over uh, over the, the current fiscal year to, to, to the 18-19 fiscal year. So one factor, um, the other factor has to be uh, the election. Um, when you have the governor and the entire state house, 203 members of the state house and half of the state senate up for election, lawmakers want to want to be out of Harrisburg, they want to be back in the districts and they want they're in their districts and they want to be they want to be in campaign mode. And they don't want a budget that's not only going to hamper on them but a budget that uh, creates creates problems for them. So economy uh, and election really uh, drove this budget to a quick resolution. Our topics today uh, walk you through the 1819 spending plan. Um, as you all know, hopefully know, the depreciation bill, which PICPA champion is now law. We'll talk about some of the re related uh, tax bills. Uh, update on the Department of Revenue. Um, give you a, a real preview from our standpoint, some of the issues we're working on in the fall um, that we won't have a lot of time, quite frankly, but we're, we're really uh, hopeful that we can get attraction on a couple of bills that we're working on. Have to talk about the, the elections and then we'll uh, give you um, give you an opportunity to, to ask some questions. So 
The 1819 state budget spends 32.7 billion. Um, that's down from the 33 billion that Governor Wolf proposed in February, down slightly. The overall operating budget of the Commonwealth, though, when you when you bring in all the other uh, other funds and other items, is around 85 billion dollars. Um, House Bill 2121 was signed into law on. June 22nd of 2017. This budget increases spending, depending on, on who you're listening to, uh, about 560 million or 1.7% over the 17 18 uh, budget year. Or um, if, if you add in uh, uh, the supplemental appropriations, it's a, a little bit over uh, seven, uh, $718 billion or 2.2%. So well within that, that in, uh, rate of inflation. Um, most of the 32, $33 billion to fund the 1819 budget is, is based on re recurring tax revenues. There is about, as we've seen in the last couple of budgets, there have been a lot of um, one-time revenue sources. You know, we had the tobacco settlement, monetizing the tobacco settlement funds last year, um, uh, trying to take money from the Joint Underwriting Association, which is still um, you know, the, something the legislature is still after. Um, but this budget only spends about uh, roughly about a billion or so, maybe a little bit more on non-recurring revenues. Um, uh, again, going after the, the JUA monies and some other things. So um, it's it's moving more towards uh, getting on a, a firmer financial footing with um, reoccurring tax revenues. A couple of other, uh, other provisions. Um, spending items this budget uh, education is a priority i'll get into that in a second education public education and higher education investments in those uh, but also this uh, 1819 state budget continues support for fighting pennsylvania's heroin and an opioid epidemic which is obviously a, uh, something on a lot of people's minds increases uh, the state's commitment to care for those with in, uh, intellectual disabilities increases uh, access to quality care um, invest in the lottery fund and puts the lottery fund on more stable financial footing. Also increases funding for roads and bridges within the municipal, uh, within the motor license fund. And also um, makes a commitment, uh, fully funds the uh, annual required contribution for both uh, the PSERS, the Public School Employees Retirement System, and the SERS, uh, State Employees Retirement System. Um, for the First time, the third third year in a row for PCERS, and I think second year in a row for SERS, uh, the, doing the full funding required by uh, by law. Uh, the PCERS funding uh, for 18-19 is about $2.49 billion. That's an increase of about $224 million, which is slightly under 10%. And the SERS uh, budget, uh, or funding for SERS, which is found in numerous different line items, um, is 685 million, um, and that's a 12 million dollar increase, or, or or two million. So, um, that's obviously a positive, a huge financial commitment from the from the Commonwealth. But it's obviously a positive that we're finally putting the money that's required by law into into those two pension funds, which is why we created the pension crisis. One of the issues that created the pension crisis in the first place. The 1819 tracking uh, run. If if you want to take a moment to look at that, that actually gives you the line item by line item uh, spending for uh, each uh, program, um, line item by line item, uh, in throughout the 30, uh, $32.7 billion spending program. So you can see how much is committed to public education in the different programs, uh, Department of Human Services, Department of Revenue. Uh, so you can see all of that um, in, in those tracking runs. And I believe uh, the, the, the the post that we have shares shows what the 1718 uh, budget was versus 1819 and the increase or decrease corresponding. So as I as I said, public education funding, uh, state budget priority number one for for this administration, throughout his uh, four budgets, increased funding for not only basic education, um, but we're, as we see this year, there will be funding for uh, higher education as well. The, uh, this year's budget increases the basic education level um, line item by 100 million to six point, uh, slightly uh, over six billion dollars. That is the again, if you go back to those tracking runs, that's the largest single line item uh, in the entire 32.7 billion dollar budget. Of that five six point uh, 
let's say, call it 6.1 billion, 539 million of that, about 8.8 percent, is allocated through the fair funding formula. The General Assembly acted a, enacted a couple of years ago. Also, increase in early childhood education funding for pre-K counts and Head Start. Uh, increase in special education to now uh, a little over uh, 1.1 billion dollars, and also um, a commitment uh, of 60 million dollars uh, appropriated through different uh, programs for school and community safety initiatives and programs, and those are found uh, throughout the uh, throughout the general fund budget. Uh, keeping with the education theme, 3% uh, increase to the Pennsylvania State-related universities at Pitt, Penn State, Lincoln, Temple, and uh, University of Penn School of Veterinary Medicine. 3.3% uh, increase in the state system of higher education. That's about $15 million, and those are the, the state-owned university, uh, Shippensburg, Millersville, Westchester, Edinburgh, Slippery Rock. 3% increase in funding to our community college and Thaddeus Stevens uh, College of Technology in Lancaster, and a $30 million uh, increase for uh, the Pennsylvania SMART program, and that's Governor Wolf's uh, computer science, uh, STEM, and workforce development initiatives. So $30 million for Penn, uh, PA SMART, $7 million under that same type of program, $7 million for apprenticeship, apprenticeship training under the Department of Labor and Industry, and another $3 million in industry partnership partnerships, also within the Department of, of, of Labor and Industry. Uh, the, the, the big issue for us uh, was clearly the uh, depreciation issue, something we had been pushing uh, for uh, since um, probably late December, early January. Uh, there were two bills. Uh, the one that uh, actually made it to the uh, across the finish line is Senate Bill 1056, uh, sponsored by Michelle Brooks. Uh, there was also a companion bill, House Bill 2017, sponsored by PICPA member Frank Ryan. Um, uh, the General Assembly, uh, in their in their negotiating process, uh, decided to move Senate Bill 1056. Um, this uh, was signed into law on June 28th of 2018, uh, and it decouples from um, it couples Pennsylvania's corporate net income tax from the bonus depreciation provision included in last year's federal job. Uh, tax Cuts and job, Jobs Act. Um, it specifically, the bill provides that the amount of the depreciation deduction claimed and allowable in calculating the taxpayer's federal income tax under the Internal Revenue Code, Section uh, 168K, which is the bonus depreciation provision, uh, is included in the calculation of Pennsylvania's uh, taxable income shall be disallowed. Um, Senate Bill 1056 also provides an additional deduction for depreciation equal to the depreciation determined in accordance with the Internal Revenue Code IRC sections 167 and 168, not 168K, 168. Um, we were, uh, uh, it also reverses Corporate Tax Bulletin uh, 2017-02, um, which essentially uh, prohibited all depreciation of assets uh, of which federal de bonus depreciation is claimed until the assets were sold or disposed of. So this is a very positive, obviously positive development, something that uh, the PICPA uh, and our state tax committee work very hard on. Um, well, quite frankly, the language um, that was in the House bill, which is very close to the, the language that was in that is in Senate Bill 1056 was language that our, our committee and, and others, but the PICPA State Tax Committee was very instrumental in, in developing. Um, also, if you haven't seen it, uh, the Department of Revenue just recently last week put out Corporate Tax Bulletin 2018-03 that addresses this issue. And it's it's essentially um, um, using the language from the statute, basically, is what it's doing, just outlining the, the department's position with regard to depreciation. Um, and, and utilizing the, the statutory language for the most part. No, no surprises in that, no surprises in that. Uh, moving on, um, the Public School Code, um, Act 3039 was signed into law on June 22nd. Uh, and the, the big changes here uh, that I'm gonna talk about are dealing with the uh, Education Improvement Tax Credit cr Program. You'll note that the, uh, the, the uh, EITC was increased 25 billion 
to 160 million. Uh, that 25 million, though, is allocated for uh, scholarship organizations. It also increases, increases the uh, um, maximum annual household income uh, for the EITC from 75 to 85 thousand dollars, and also increases or actually changes a number of the due dates in the statute. Uh, from when you're when these organizations are required to submit information to, to, to the department and other and, and other uh, another filing. So uh, again, I would I would uh, urge you if you have clients and I know a lot of members do that take advantage of this program uh, to certainly take a look at the change in, in the, the, the due dates for some of these uh, for, for some of these filings. Other changes um, in the law, uh, the verification of income, uh, there's new language dealing with the verification of income. Uh, each scholarship organization, pre-K scholarship organization and opportunity scholarship organization shall provide an application and review process um, for scholarship applicants. That includes a means of verifying household income, uh, which may include submission of household members, uh, most recently available federal tax, uh, tax returns if required. A couple of other changes dealing with contributions. Uh, in the event a business firm does not make a, a minimum of 50% of the full amount of the approved contribution and, and has not notified the department of the amount, and the department is, uh, I believe, DCED, of unused contributions within 14 days of approval, the business firm's application may not be approved and the immediately succeeding uh, fiscal year for more than 150% of the actual amount contributed in the previous fiscal year. A um, couple of other changes. Uh, in order to be eligible for, in order to be eligible for application date under uh, the, the, the provision, co the contributions included in the second year of a two-year commitment or renewal of a two-year commitment must be made in this, to the same type of program. And also, um, language is added uh, if, if the department fails for a period of at least 10 days to timely transmit any of the written notices required. Uh, under the law, the affected business may bring an action or in, for injunction or other appropriate relief in Commonwealth Court. So a number of changes to the EITC program that uh, you want to take a uh, perhaps a, a closer look at. Um, the Human Services Code and the Fiscal Code. Um, uh, you know, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but um, there was only there was no uh, there was no uh, Tax reform code changes other than uh, other than the depreciation. Um, so this budget has no uh, no uh, tax changes other than the depreciation. Uh, we were concerned that we might see some some changes in the uh, through the fiscal code, but um, no no surprises this year. But in the Her Human Services Code, which is Act 40 now. Um, it reauthorizes the state hospital assessment program. Not only reauthorize it, but it also includes a, a, a significant hike in the assessment, about a 60% hike, um, which would generate another $75 million assessment against, against hospitals, bring that uh, total assessment up to a little over $300 million. Um, it could have been worse. The administration was proposing a, 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 a even higher increase in the assessment to generate an additional 130, so they cut that almost um, almost in half. Um, and the fiscal code, um, this is kind of the the this is like the operating manual, if you will, and how the 32.7 billion dollars is supposed to be spent uh, in the general fund. It's kind of also can be used as a kitchen sink, and, and a lot of times their stuff is thrown into the into the keystone into the um, uh, fiscal fiscal code. Fortunately, not this year. Uh, two two uh, programs that I want to highlight is the new uh, Keystone Scholars Grant Program, which was championed by Treasurer Joe Torcella. Um, this is a, a new program uh, within the tuition. It's within Treasury, but it's within the Treasury Tuition Account Guaranteed Savings Program. At least initially, uh, it provides for a hundred dollar uh, uh, scholarship, if you will, to every child born in the Commonwealth um, beginning after January 1 of 2019. No taxpayer money is being used for this. Um, it will be uh, uh, funded by um, some outside, uh, initially through the, the excess revenues from um, the, the TAP program, but then by, uh, uh, by uh, private, private contributors. So no taxpayer money uh, for that program. 
And the enhanced revenue collection account uh, within the Department of Revenue is reauthorized for a number of, uh, a, a couple more years. I think there's a $30 million uh, uh, line item for this in the uh, fiscal code. And this is, uh, this is the, uh, the initiative that the department, the funding the department's using uh, was using for, I think, the uh, Schedule C reviews and some, some other things. So that program has been reauthorized for another, I think, at least two years, two fiscal years. Uh, some housekeeping bills um, that are part of the, the budget package. Um, again, these are all, have all been signed into law uh, by the governor. House Bill uh, 2078 uh, funds uh, the Bureau of Professional Occupational Affairs, which includes the Athletic Commission and the State Board of Accountancy. That is a, a $62 million um, uh, funding. The uh, Worker Workmen's Compensation Administration Fund, that's another $71.2 million. The Office of Small Business Advocate is uh, $1.85 million. Office of Consumer Advocate is $5.85 million. Again, a few more housekeeping bills. The uh, Public School Employees Retirement uh, Board is, um, and again, these are all signed into law. That out, that uh, allocation is uh, 51.6 million. State Employees Retirement Board, 31, uh, roughly 31 million. The Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia Parking Authority is uh, 2.9, almost three million dollars. And the Public uh, Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission sets. Uh, rates, uh, electric rates and public utility rates um, is uh, $74 million. And the state gaming fund, the state gaming board, uh, House Bill 2086, uh, that's, uh, that appropriates $74 million for the gaming, the gaming board. On the non-preferreds, as I said earlier, uh, these all received a across the board 3% increase. Um, Penn State, uh, that line out, that budget is, or that appropriation is now $260 million. The University of Pitt is $151 million. Uh, Temple is $155 million. Lincoln, uh, uh, 14, uh, $15 million. And the University of Penn's School of Veterinary Medicine is $31.3 million. So there you have, um, kind of a, a very high level overview of the 17, 18, 19 state budget. Again, to recap, um, uh, spends 32.7, no broad base, no tax increases, a bonus or depreciation is now law. Um, uh, and I don't think I mentioned it, but I, I, I have, I think I, I failed to mention it, but the bonus depreciation provision, the bonus depreciation law goes into effect um, it's applicable to tax years beginning after uh, December 31st, 2016. So the bonus depreciation is retroactive to 12-31-2016. So what didn't make it into the state budget? Well, um, you probably know the severance tax, uh, which governor has been uh, advocating for for the last four years. He called for it in his budget address in February, but. Um, there was it, that that talk died uh, it, earlier this year uh, when it looked like the budget was coming together without uh, a, a lot of fanfare. So um, that issue will definitely be back next year um, with the next budget. Uh, if uh, I assuming if Governor Wolf wins, uh, that that certainly will be back uh, as a priority for 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 him. Combined reporting. Uh, again, is something that is uh, always championed um, by uh, uh, certain legislators. Uh, didn't make it into this into this budget. Um, corporate net uh, tax CNI rate uh, reduction. Again, Governor Wolf proposed this along with combined reporting in February. Did not make it into this year's budget. But again, something that we're going to hear a lot about uh, in the coming years. Increase in the minimum wage. While not part of this year's budget. I think you'll see something, uh, an effort in the fall when the, the General Assembly returns to maybe tee that up for consideration. You know, it is an election year, so uh, there may be a little bit more um, political uh, interest in, in doing that on, on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the aisle. A couple of other things that did not make it into, um, into this year's budget, uh, again, is consolidation of the Departments of Human Services and the Department of Health, something that has been um, talked about uh, by the Wolf administration and some lawmakers for the last couple of years. 
the hope there is through uh, you know efficiencies through consolidation. Um, again, I think that's something that will continue to be part of a part of a discussion. Uh, and municipal services fee for state police coverage. Again, something that was part of the proposed budget, um, paying for those municipalities who do not have their own police coverage um, have state police coverage, but pay nothing for it. Um, and the governor and a lot of lawmakers want to have those uh, those municipalities uh, pay some share of the cost for that. So those are some items. Again, I, you know the severance tax issue. Whoever is, is governor next January, the issue is not going to go away because there's a there's strong um, bipartisan support in both, particularly in the House uh, and 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 also in in the Senate, but more so in the House to do something on the severance tax. Um, the governor put a in his budget put a um, a price tag on it at a at a, a two about a two hundred fifty million dollar level for the eighteen nineteen year. Um, that, uh, according to 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 most um, observers, may be a little high, but um, again, that's an issue that is is not going to go away. Let's take a look quickly, and I apologize. I know this is really hard to see. It's hard for me to see, but you look at the financial statement. Uh, for the 18-19 uh, year, which is obviously the middle column. Uh, just a couple of highlights here. You, you, you see under 17-18, the, the current, the base revenue estimates, that jumped by 9.6%. Um, that's because of the Tobacco Settlement Fund and the other one-time uh, one uh, uh, revenues that were shifted over in that year's budget. You can see for the first time in a number of years at the bottom of that column, um, the 19.8 million that's put, put into the, it's called the rainy day fund. First time in a number of years, I don't know how many, but first time in a number of years that we're seeing that. Um, in the 18-19 budget, um, you'll see uh, the, again, the base revenue estimate, uh, while it, it, it drops a little bit, uh, the general fund tax revenues, as I mentioned earlier, the general fund tax revenues. So when you look at um, sales and use, corporate, uh, net income tax, and personal income tax, and a couple of other gross receipts tax. Uh, IFO, the Independent Fiscal Office, projects that those big three and a half, considering the gross receipts tax, will increase by about 4% over the over last year's 17-18. So, again, positive uh, positive economic news, or, uh, I guess, for the for the state. A couple of adjustments. You can see uh, school safety initiatives at 45 million. Um, Gaming license from from uh, iGaming and Sports Ragering, they're they're booking 125 million for that. Bonus depreciation at 102 million. Um, projected loss to in revenues to the Commonwealth. Uh, we 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 think that's high. Um, the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, when they did their fiscal uh, analysis of both House Bill 2017, Representative Ryan's bill, and then. Senator Brooks's bill, which which became law, pegged pegged those numbers, uh, lost revenues to the Commonwealth at uh, a little over between eight and ten million in the 17-18 fiscal year, and uh, about twenty million, just under tw under twenty million for the 18-19 fiscal year. Those those seem to be a little bit more uh, on, on on target uh, than the hundred million, but we'll have to wait and see. And at the bottom again, at the bottom of that column, uh, another two point. Uh, eight million uh, moved into the rainy day fund uh, at the end of the 1819 fiscal year. So uh, really quick, uh, what should we anticipate next year? Um, I, I wish we could bottle up some of the uh, the goodwill and the uh, cooperation that we saw in this year's budget for uh, next June of 2000 June and July of 2019, but uh, I think, uh, and I hate to say this, and it's it's really obviously too early to tell, but I, I can see, I can certainly see us reverting back to uh, the last um, the two or three budget years prior to this one, and having a little bit more of a, 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 a knockout, dragout fight, um, particularly, um, uh, you know, the the severance tax issue is not going to go away. Uh, the Commonwealth is going to have to, the legislators are going to have to come up with funding for that billion dollars uh, that was uh, used for this year's budget, the non-recurring revenues, um, you know, that's a pretty big number. And 
the, uh, the, the Commonwealth's debt load is going to increase as well with, uh, you know, starting to have to pay back the uh, tobacco settlement funds that were, were monetized. So um, <clears throat> a little black cloud over the horizon in, in 19, uh, the 1920 uh, budget year. Um, but again, uh, you know, the, the economy could continue humming along and uh, this could be a, a, a non-issue. Uh, we could have another uh, uh, kumbaya type of budget in, in, in next June or July, but we'll, so we'll have to wait and see. Moving on, uh, Department of Revenue. Let's talk about uh, what's going on with the department. Um, of course, the new, um, relatively new uh, 1099 miscellaneous non-resident withholding requirement that was part of Act of 43 of 2017, which requires taxpayers to withhold at a rate of 3.07. Um, percent on Pennsylvania source income payments made to non-residents um, that uh, payments that exceed about five thousand dollars in the calendar year. Uh, that provision went into effect January one of two thousand eighteen. Uh, but the, the Department of Revenue, um, after uh, at PICP's request and others, decided to kind of pause uh, the 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 implementation of that to give themselves and taxpayers enough time to um, to implement the necessary uh, infrastructure to be able to to carry this program out. So um, January, July 1, 2018, uh, the department launched their new website, uh, which you can access through that link. Uh, the PICPA, uh, our members of our state task committee have been working with the department who's been have been very open um, to uh, getting input from practitioners um, in addressing uh, addressing practitioners' concerns. So this uh, new website provides an overview of the key terms, a detailed explanation of Pennsylvania's sourcing income rules, uh, and directions on on what's required under the law. There's also an FAQ provision, a frequently asked questions provision. But I would encourage you, if you haven't taken a look at this website, please do so and provide us feedback. Uh, we're in communication with the department um, on a regular basis. They want to hear from practitioners. Um, obviously, they don't want to be inundated with phone calls. They would rather have a spot where taxpayers can go and practitioners can go and get their questions answered. So um, that web, it, the website is very helpful. Um, and I think you'll find a lot of answers to your questions on that website. But if not, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, Again, we're working with the department on this. Um, there, I'll also talk in a minute about a, some legislation that we're working on, but um, the, the website is very helpful, and I think uh, um, the department has done a good job of, of, of getting a lot of uh, questions answered through this website. Their new uh, research and development tax credit online application program uh, was launched June 1. Um, Actually, we have a demonstration of that uh, program, I think through a webinar tomorrow afternoon. So if you have an opportunity, if you haven't registered for that, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, department officials, uh, along with uh, Jason Screenack, um, member of our state tax committee with uh, state, uh, state tax practitioner with RKL here in Harrisburg, will be doing a, uh, doing a, a walkthrough of the, of the, the system. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, modernization uh, of the uh, <clears throat> uh, the department's modernization uh, project kicked off on May 14th. Um, the, the department is, has contracted with Fast Enterprises LLC. Uh, um, the, the department will be working with Fast Enterprises uh, with um, to implement the new uh, system to process uh, about five types of, of taxes, different uh, taxes, tax types. Uh, Fast uh, Fast Enterprises has success, successfully implemented uh, its uh, Gen Tax software package in a number of states, uh, 29 or so, including California, Massachusetts, Illinois, and Georgia. Uh, the department's work with Fast Track is scheduled to be broken into three rollouts, uh, starting with motor and alternative fuels tax and inter international fuels tax agreement. The second rollout will include realty transfer and inheritance tax, and the final rollout will include PIT, personal income tax, and pass through entity processing and property tax and, and uh, rent rebate program. So uh, that project is moving forward rapidly. I know the department has uh, pulled a number of, of, of resources from different, uh, different areas, um, and 
uh, is uh, looking to uh, tap into the PICPA as a, as a sounding board as well. So that's something you'll, you'll be you're hearing more and more about over the next, uh, uh, next couple of months and next couple of years. Also, the new uh, E-Tides, I'm not sure how new it is anymore, but just call your attention to it as well. Again, the new E-Tides Document Center. Um, it's the online system that business and uh, tax professionals, tax uh, practitioners can use to electronically file business tax returns. Um, the electronic filing, electronic uh, correspondence feature allows business owners and tax practitioners uh, the option to receive all correspondence from the department electronically. Um, it's all this new functionality is available to both businesses, uh, business taxpayers, and practitioners uh, once the appropriate access has been granted. So again, uh, the new ETIES document uh, system, something we would encourage you to take a look at. Um, not on here, but I'll, I'll talk about it real quickly, is the uh, Wayfair uh, decision. Um, you, as you know, the department, uh, the department, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court issued uh, its decision in Wayfair uh, early this month or, or earlier this month um, that that basically said that uh, states can can tax um, outside vendors, uh, the Amazons of the world, um, and you know, I didn't give them carte blanche. Uh, basically, broke down the uh, the the old uh, the old rules, um, so. Not anticipating this to have a significant impact in Pennsylvania. Actually, a PA kind of got a jump on this last year with their marketplace sales uh, reporting requirement that that kicked off, that kicked in earlier this year. So um, again, not not anticipating to see a huge impact, but uh, we are monitoring this, and I know the department, I believe, is working on a bulletin to provide additional clarification. Let's look at. Um, the fall legislative session, as I said earlier, you know, we have a couple of initiatives that we're working on. We don't have a lot of time in both in, with the House and Senate schedules. Again, election year, the lawmakers don't want to be in Harrisburg. They want to be back in their districts uh, campaigning. So you can see the Senate calendar, nine days. That day in November is really just a token day for leadership elections. Um, the House has a few more days, but again, uh, that November date is, you know, November is, has been off limits for a number of years. So. Um, not a lot of time to get some things moving. So here's our agenda. Um, I've just mentioned about the 1099 review. Um, so um, the website is, is excellent. It's a great resource, but we still think there needs to be some uh, uh, refinements to, to the law itself. And uh, we've been working with uh, Representative Keith Greiner, Representative Frank Ryan, um, and a number of other lawmakers to address some concerns with compliance that we've heard from not only members of our state tax committee, but, but others as well. So you have two bills, House Bill 2027, which is Representative Frank Ryan's bill that would delete, eliminate the, the reporting requirement. Um, and Representative Griner's bill 2413, that would be more of a technical, we're, we're terming it a technical correction or a refinement proposal. Um, those are both in the House Finance Committee. And I know a lot of members are saying, well, why don't we why don't we go for the elimination? Well, one, there's a fiscal impact. Um, I think IFO put it at uh, 20 million or so. So we have to make that up elsewhere. Uh, and, and so where do you want to make it? Um, what do you want to what, what changes do you want to enact? Last year, um, last year, the, the alternative was change additional changes to the tax appeals process. The other problem is you know, the administration is going to oppose us, and that's going to obviously be a red flag. And so we're trying to work within the system, within the statute, to make uh, to make improvements. House Bill 2003, uh, Representative Michael Kors bill that would require one form uh, for estates and revocable, revocable trust, similar to um, the, the federal system. This bill was reported out of the House Finance Committee last month and is currently pending in the House. No fiscal. We believe there's no fiscal impact. So again, if we can if we can make these changes that have no fiscal impact, you know, we have at least we have a, a fighting chance in in the fall to get something done. Consolidation of business privilege tax bill, Senate Bill uh, 653, sponsored by Senator Pat Brown, was reported by the Senate, uh, went to the House Local Government Committee, and, and was amended. Uh, there was an amendment that uh, was not to the liking of a lot of the tax collectors who were pushing this legislation. Um, I don't want to say the bill's dead, but um, uh, because it, 
anything can be resurrected, particularly something that has passed one chamber. But um, this is this this bill has still has a fair amount of work and, and political obstacles to overcome. Statewide uh, EIT collection study, House Bill uh, House Resolution 291, sponsored by Representative Mike Piper of the department. This directs the department to study the statewide collection of the local earned income tax. PICPA met with the department last month. We have another meeting later this month with with revenue. Um, just not taking a position, but just having practitioners share uh, the pros and cons of uh, the current system, the pros and cons of of also um, the statewide collection. Uh, not on here, but uh, something you're going to hear more about: state tax reform. Uh, there's a subcommittee in the House of the House Finance Committee that's looking at tax reform and tax modernization. Uh, they're due with a, uh, a due to issue a report later this year. And also the Tax Foundation is also doing a comprehensive study of Pennsylvania's taxing system uh, when, uh, at, with recommendations, and that's due out uh, later this year as well. Sales tax on services, while it's been quiet, um, you know, we're cautiously, uh, we're, we're monitoring that issue very, very diligently. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we could see something uh, raise its head uh, in the fall, right before the election. So we're 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 monitoring that very closely. Real quickly, let me cover the um, uh, the elections. Um, a couple of things. Uh, obviously, a big election at the top of the ticket. You have uh, the U.S. Senate race, where you have incumbent Bob Casey versus uh, local Congressman Lou Barletta. All 18 of Pennsylvania's congressional seats are up. Uh, Republicans currently hold a 13, 13 of those 18 seats. You're, you're going to see that you're going to see that margin narrow after uh, after the November elections. And of course, uh, Tom Wolf incumbent uh, versus Scott Wagner, former state senator Scott Wagner. So the the the, 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 the political uh, center of the Commonwealth is Little Old York, Pennsylvania. Um, Wolf and, and Wagner are both from York, so it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how York County goes that day uh, on in November. Um, and state uh, state Senate, and state House seats, 25 of the 50 state Senate seats are up, and all 203 um, state House seats are up this year. So 100 and, about 117 days, uh, three months, 25 days, and about 12 and a half to 13 hours. Uh, until the November election, so I, I'm pretty sure between now and then you're going to you're going to be inundated by a couple of uh, uh, campaign commercials. Uh, the congressional seats, um, most of these are the open seats um, that we have, except for a few. The big one that we're watching is the first uh, congressional uh, race with um, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, who's a CPA, um, running for that running for re-election in that in that seat. A couple of others to highlight here: the ninth. Uh, congressional district, Dennis Wolf versus Dan Mus Muser, former uh, state cabinet secretaries. Uh, uh, Mr. Wolf was the ag secretary for uh, Governor Rendell, and many of you know uh, Mr. Muser was the revenue secretary under uh, uh, Tom Corbett. And I believe there's a typo um, somewhere, somebody just pointed out, oh, under in the seventh district, um, Susan Wild versus it's not Mary Northstein, it's Marty Northstein. So, thanks, Steve, for pointing that out. And uh, and a race between incumbents in the 17th, Keith Rothfuss versus uh, Dan uh, Connor Lamb, uh, which should be an interesting which should be an interesting battle. Um, as I mentioned, the Pennsylvania you're going to be inundated with uh, outside money commercials. Uh, Pennsylvania is really the epicenter, one of the epicenters for the national uh, the national campaigns because um, Democrats feel that they can pick up a number of seats to uh, for the U.S. House in their effort to regain control of the U.S. House. State Senate, uh, real quickly here, um, the Republicans hold a 33-16. It was 34 until about a month ago. Scott Wagner resigned to run to focus on his gubernatorial cam uh, campaign. Um, our priority race is uh, Pat uh, Brown, CPA uh, from the Lehigh Valley, chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, and, you know, that Lehigh Valley area um, has a Philadelphia influence. So um, this election is, is going to be a very difficult one for anybody on the ballot who. Um, so the, he's 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 clearly our, our top priority. There are five um, there are five open seats. Uh, I've listed three there. Uh, Stu Greenleaf Jr., 
uh, versus Maria Collette. Um, this is uh, Senator Greenleaf's, uh, so Senator Greenleaf's son, Stewart Jr., is running for this a seat in Montgomery County. Uh, a race in uh, Bucks County of a current sitting rep, Marguerite Quinn, versus former rep, uh, Steve Sanisario. I think he uh, left the House a couple years ago to run for Congress and didn't fare very well, and now is back running for a state Senate seat. And out in Pittsburgh, the Senator Volokovich was defeated for in his reelection by Jeremy Schaefer, um, and Mr. Schaefer is being challenged by Lindsey Williams. So those are really the three highlights. Uh, a couple of incumbents have challenges. Uh, Senator Tommy Tomlinson is being challenged by uh, Representative Tina Davis in Bucks County. And uh, Senator Tom McGarrigle in Delaware County has a uh, has a uh, significant challenger. State House Republicans control uh, the House 121 to 82. Uh, there are a significant number of uh, of retirements um, through um, own, their own retirement or through the election where the the law, uh, voters retired them. That there are, will be 29 uh, open seats uh, in this this year's state house races, uh, uh, 200 and, uh, 203, and there has been a significant. Maybe in our next uh, uh, our next update, I'll show the changeover over the last six to eight years. Um, a lot of uh, a, lo a lot of turnover uh, in the state house. So 29 open seats. Unfortunately, uh, 29 include uh, two uh, very uh, staunch supporters of the PICPA. Uh, Representative John Marr, who is the dean of the ha uh, House CPA delegation from Allegheny County, has decided to call it quits. And Re Representative Michael Corr, a freshman, uh, has decided because of family and other uh, family constraints, has decided not to seek re-election. So losing two, uh, two um, CPAs to champions of the profession. Um, so these four are, are, are House priorities, uh, getting these for Representative Keith Griner from Lancaster, Representative Mike Pfeiffer from Pike County, Representative George Dunbar, Westmoreland, and Frank Ryan from Lebanon County, getting those four reelected. They all have opponents, um, and they all all receive significant support from CPA PAC. So uh, again, my, my plug for the PAC, particularly in this election year, uh, these races are more and more expensive. Um, and if we don't have these four in the House and Pat Brown in the Senate, um, the challenge for us to get our legislative agenda through uh, increases significantly. So again, if you haven't contributed this year, I, I would ask you why not and, and, and you know, step up and support the PAC and support the lawmakers who support us in our legislative initiatives. You know, all four of these legislators and, and Pat Brown have all championed issues for us over the last couple of years. Representative Greiner has done a number of, um, has uh, championed a number of bills that were signed into law earlier this year. Representative Dunbar championed the EIT, our local EIT, Earned Income Tax Reform Initiative. Uh, Representative Ryan and Representative Piper the same, and Senator uh, Brown. So I would encourage you uh, to support the PAC. Um, and questions. Obviously, if there are questions, we'll try to answer them now. If not, feel free, please feel free to email me offline. I'd be happy to take your questions. Um, follow us on Twitter. Uh, that's usually where we put information out as quickly as possible. You know, when the department put out its uh, weight, uh, put out its uh, depreciation bulletin, um, we immediately posted it on, on Twitter. And then follow us. Uh, with that, I'm going to Turn it over to Ashley. Yeah. Ashley, you there? Hi, Peter. You actually do have three questions in the Q and A. Um, question from uh, Jim Newhart: Has PA's provision for depreciation regarding the uh, Tax Collection and Job Act uh, been adopted by Philadelphia as of yet? Um, not. The, I have not, Jim. I have not seen you know, Philadelphia adopted what Pennsylvania did a little after the fact. Uh, haven't uh, haven't seen um, whether they would they have followed suit yet. We anticipate they will. We anticipate they will, but haven't seen that um, haven't seen that yet. Official notification. Uh, and I would any any of our members from Philly who are on the on the call or on the on the uh, on the the webinar. If you're aware of anything, please let me know. I'd like to get that out. Uh, what are, and from Barry Gerber, what are actual increases total funding for state related uh, state system? 
Um, Barry, I don't have those. Uh, the I, I know for the state um, state system uh, colleges, it's about 15 million. Uh, the others are three, uh, approximately three percent uh, across the board, uh, and they vary depending on on the the, the 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 initial line item. But you can see what those increases are if you go to those tracking charts, the tracking charts that I shared at the beginning of this session. And the last one. Um, for years, we've heard about uh, structural deficit. This year's budget seems to be balanced without tax increases. So what happened to the structural deficit? Well, what happened is um, we monetized about $1.5 in uh, tobacco settlement funds and used that, those proceeds to kind of um, uh, balance, uh, balance the budget and, and uh, at least for a time, for a time uh, do away with the structural deficit. Ashley, I think that's it. All right. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, everyone, for participating today. Thank you all.